Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. Now there is an ideology that's circulating in developing countries that has become the root of all problems. It did its damage in the West back in the day. The financial meltdown of 2007-8, the offshoring of wealth and power of which the Panama, Panama Papers offer us merely a glimpse, um, the slow collapse of public health and education sectors, Resurgence of child poverty, the epidemic of loneliness, the collapse of ecosystems and the rise of hate speech to name a few. But we responded to these crises as if they emerged in isolation. Apparently unaware that they have all been either catalyst or exacerbated by the same coherent philosophy. A philosophy that has or had no name. What greater power can there be to operate namelessly? So now it has a name and it's called neoliberalism. For many years, this doctrine operated namelessly and thought it was progressive to give way to its ideology. Later people worldwide began to realize that it was not a solution, but more so the root of all problems. In Sri Lanka too, most economic policies that have let us down have stemmed from this thinking. Neoliberalism seems good on paper, but never in the real world. It started with the open economy in the 70s here in Sri Lanka, and now we suffer from that moronic ideology. Sadly, our leaders have been fooled to the level that they still think it is the solution. Fake think tanks funded by these very masters of that ideology continue to promote that uh, BS in this country. While they will never pay for its errors, instead it will be you and me. Let's put some context uh, into this conversation. Join me now via Zoom from Glasgow, Scotland. He is pro a former professor of economics at the University of Glasgow and author Professor William Paul Cockshot. Thank you so much, uh, Professor, for being here. I appreciate your time. Now, we have seen a rise in neoliberal thinking in economics, uh, in the economic space in recent times. I want to ask you, uh, what exactly has been the impact of this, especially on emerging economies like Sri Lanka? Yes, Mahesh, that's a good question. It, it goes right back to the coup against Allende in the 1970s, when you had a government that was intent on a different course of development in Chile, and the US organized a coup against it and put in place a military dictator who followed the economic doctrines of the Chicago School and imposed drastic reductions in living standards in Chile in response to defend the interests of American business in Chile. It then became a, a general doctrine that was called the Washington Consensus and wasn't necessarily imposed by military means as it had been in Chile, but was imposed by the international institutions that Washington controls, um, primarily the IMF, but also the World Bank. And the general aim of all these policies has to be to reduce the income and living standards of the great mass of the people in those countries where it took control in order to divert money either to American business or indirectly to the banking sector, the, the big international finance organizations. That, that's the essence of what neoliberal policy stands to. It's financial capital rather than industrial capital. Indeed, uh, Professor. Now, how did the banking crisis, which uh, we saw in the United States, uh, affect developing countries such as Sri Lanka and this part of the world? Well, it, it's due to the, the hollowing out of the productive economy in the United States, which has led to the US running a huge trade deficit, which has amounted to a form of tribute, which the US has been able to impose on the rest of the world due to its um, position as the world currency, the dollar's position as the world currency. Now, with the rise of an alternative model, the Peking model, you see that 
the US is ceding its position as the leading economy in the world. It is no longer the world's main manufacturing center. And as a result, the cost of borrowing for the United States to maintain its deficit is rising, especially as a consequence of the US and Europe seizing Russian dollar assets. This has removed the trustworthiness of the American banking system. And in order to attract funds, they have to raise the interest rate. And most US, a large part of the US banking system had assets which were in the form of treasury bills, US treasury bills. As the, the interest rate rose, they fell in value and the banks can no longer have sufficient reserves. Now, in the short term, this is likely to re lead to a rise in dollar interest rates, but this is a transitional, we're in a transitional phase between the, the dominance of the dollar as world currency and the supplanting of the dollar of world currency. And this is a period of instability between these two eras. So it's difficult to predict the exact impact of that, but it's probable that it will give greater freedom to developing countries than existed under the dollar hegemony. Professor, uh, we are looking for a lot of solution as a nation. Now, what key models do you suggest that a country like Sri Lanka should uh, follow to gain reasonable development moving forward after this economic crisis? Well, you, you really have to look at why China succeeded so well or why Vietnam has succeeded. They basically succeeded because they had the kind of radical revolution that only occurred in the past in France and Russia. They had a system in which they undermined the revenues of the old land earning classes. That is absolutely the key thing the Chinese did. They nationalized the land. This enabled the state to gain control of the revenues which formerly were wasted. This is the whole point of Adam Smith's classical economics, that the land earning class is unproductive and prevents the development of an economy. And what the Chinese did is they got rid of that land earning class and ensured that the surplus product of the Chinese economy went into reinvestment. They achieved their uh, astonishing levels of growth because during, say, 10, 15 years ago, they were reinvesting 45% of GDP. If you reinvest 45% of GDP, as the Chinese were doing, or as the Soviets were doing in the 1930s, then you can achieve what appears a miraculous performance. But it's absolutely necessary that the state is able to control and redirect the whole economic surplus towards accumulation rather than luxury consumption. That is absolutely the essence. Makes a lot of sense. Well, we have to leave it at that. Thank you. That was a former professor of economics at the University of Glasgow and author, Professor William Paul Cockshot. A short break now. When we return, Sri Lanka's investment opportunities. Is it bleak? State Minister of Investment Promotion, William Mamalakamal, will join me shortly. This is the State of the Nation back in a moment.